just came from Crafting with Kay. How are we all doing? So welcome to my new segment called The Reading Nook. Um, I reached out to uh, an excellent author called Sharon Hannaford and she uh, gladly gave me permission to read her Hellcat series to you. Uh, she's one of my top two favourite authors of all time. I have a couple of mugs, so fill up a cup and drink and yeah, join us for the project. So, what perfect diet and painting to use is the little dragon <laughs> reading a book, drinking a drink, cozying up for the night, <laughs> for the evening. So yeah, grab a project, grab a drink, and yeah, listen along. Uh, just a heads up, I'm not the best at reading out loud, so I will probably butcher some names, uh, but please, <laughs> I will get there in the end. Either way, I hope you enjoy uh, this new segment. Take care, guys. Enjoy. Chapter 8 The drive to the drop-off point was a largely silent one. Nathan asked her where she would like to be taken, and after about ten minutes of driving informed her that she could remove the blindfold. She did so immediately. She was being chauffeured in a BMW SUV. Being in a master vampire seemed to be a lucrative business. Looking out of the darkened windows of the large car, nothing appeared familiar at first. Then she started to pick out a few recognisable landmarks and got her bearings. She pulled out her phone and called Carl, telling him she would be at the pickup point in a few minutes. The quiet time in the car had given her a chance to digest what Julius had told her. She'd sifted through all the information he'd given her and tried to figure out how she was going to put the proposal forward to the council. She knew there was going to be instant distrust of Julius and his motives. They were going to want some kind of proof that it wasn't him summoning the demons himself or that this wasn't just a personal vendetta against a rival. Gabby thought the key to finding out the truth may well lie with, with what the Magi High Council could tell them about, about the Dark Mage, who Julius claimed was working with Dante. Julius only knew her first name, Mar Mariska, but that may be enough to obtain some information. The Magi Council governed all Magi born and was what Gabby considered a busybody organisation. They kept records of all Magi born, those they knew of anyway, and tended to keep tabs on those with pure Magi blood throughout their lives, whether they practised the art or not. The High Council oversaw all of the city and town-based councils and kept Central Records Department in a, highly in a highly secret location, protected by numerous spells and wards. They'd been keeping information on Magi for over 300 years, if information about this Mariska existed, they would have it. Now all Gabby needed to do was to convince the high and mighty Athena to request the information. Maybe she should take Raz with her to the meeting, she mused with a malicious grin. Her musings came to a halt as they rounded a bend and came within sight of Carl's van, parked outside their current gym. There was no other vehicles in the parking lot yet. It was still a couple hours before opening, so Nathan stopped the car a few metres away. Miss Bradford, he rumbled in a slightly lighter bass than his brother's, turning in his seat to face her. I would like to apologise again for the way things turned out tonight. They were never supposed to come you was never supposed to come to any harm, and I was taken completely by surprise by Genevieve's attack. Gabby paused in her reach for the door handle. All right, she said evenly. Why have you found it so important to tell me that? Nathan pursed his lips. I don't want you to get the wrong impression of Julius. I know this looks bad, perhaps like he set the whole thing up, but he generally did give us the order to bring you to him unharmed, and also to make sure that the wolf was left alone and unharmed. He paused for a moment, chewing on his lower lip, then seemed to come to a decision. You see, I probably shouldn't be telling you this, but I think you may need to look at the situation from another perspective. Julius has only been master of the city for a few years. In that time he's made changes, and not, ev and not all vampires in the clan are happy with the new regime. I'm afraid there are those who don't agree with this decision to try and join forces with you. Gabby suddenly tensed, ready to fling herself out of the car. Nathan just smiled apologetically. No, no, you've got nothing to worry from me. I'm with him on this. I trust Julius with my life, and I think the changes he's made are for the betterment of all of us. He shook his head. Even if I didn't agree with him, I would never go against his orders. But you should know that there are others who think less of him for asking for your assistance. In vampire society, asking for assistance is seen as showing weakness. If he's asking for your help, he's serious about the threat that's heading our way. 
I'll try to, I'll try to take that into account, Gabby said diplomatically. Carl had lost patience waiting for her and strode over to rip the car door open and poke his head inside. You coming? He asked brusquely, glaring darkly at the vampire in the driver's seat. Carl reached over and picked up the bundle containing her swords and thrust them at Carl. Take these, she ordered, pushing them into his hands and pushing him backwards so she could get out. As she eased out of the car, Carl took in the fact that she was only using one arm and his lip twisted in an angry snarl. She sighed, sighed tiredly. Leaning towards the car, she said, Thanks for the ride, Nate, and slammed the door closed, turning back to face Carl as the car pulled away smoothly. The expression on Carl's face was caught somewhere between concern and anger. What's wrong with your arm? he demanded. You didn't tell me you'd been hurt. Because I knew how you'd react. Gabby's tempered flare instantly. I'm a big girl. I can look after myself. We have much bigger concerns than my arm, she finished darkly. What? I'm not allowed to worry about you now? he demanded. But she saw the slightly hurt look in his eyes. She sighed heavily and her ribs protested. Sorry, it's been a long night. I'm just tired and sore and confused. Let's just get in the van and head home. I'll fill, fill you in on the way. Kyle grumbled but moved to the van and opened the door and helped her in, dumping the bundle of, weapon, bundle of weapons on the floor at her feet. He got in and started the van, checked for potential tails and headed out of the city towards Gabby's house. He was silent for the most part, so Gabby filled him in, first on the fight with the vampires, then the meeting with Julius, only asking the odd question when she didn't give him enough detail. His expression went from tight-lipped fury at the kidnapping to incredulous disbelief over the reason for the meeting and finally to a deep thoughtfulness coupled with vague suspicion as he tried to work out what other motives could lie behind the proposal from Julius. At home, Gabby sidestepped the assault by Raz when she walked in the door and left him to walk stiff-legged and haunty disgust to the kitchen on his own four legs, tail twitching. He seemed to forgive her, though, when he jumped on the counter and allowed her to give him a rough one-handed peck. She switched on the coffee maker and took down some mugs as Carl took a stool at the counter and they continued their discussion. Slinky galloped into the kitchen and patted imperiously at Carl's leg until he lifted the squirming animal up on her to his lap. The little, cri the little critter promptly curled up content and went to sleep. The most obvious possibility, Gabby said is that he needs our help to get rid of this Dante. But Dante isn't actually as dangerous as the rest of us as Julius is making him out to be. Julius could well be using a dark mage himself to bring the demons into the city to scare us into helping him. She leaned back against the kitchen counter and erupted a lollipop using her teeth, sticking it in her mouth as she looked at Cole for input. Cole raised his eyebrows speculatively. Or it could be some kind of trap for the SMV. Get us to trust him, expose our numbers to him, and then he wipes us out as soon as he as soon as he sees where our vulnerabilities are. Gabby couldn't really fault his distrust. They knew so little about the vampire race, and she knew the same prejudice would probably be shown by the council at tomorrow's meeting. She personally had more than enough reasons to hate them. I honestly don't think we're that much of a threat to him. She disagreed, talking around the lollipop. He is the single most powerful vamp I've ever been anywhere near. What would he have to fear from our little organisation? Which takes care of the dregs of the supernatural society anyway. He didn't come across as the type with such a fragile ego that he would need to eliminate us simply to prove he can. He was very self-assured, very self-confident. Not in the way that feels like he needed to prove anything. Not like one of those who is so insecure that they have to do powerful things to prove to everyone that they're strongest, the most ruthless, the most powerful. She paused to pour the coffee into the mugs and took them one at a time over to where Carl sat. You know, something that Nat, the driver, said to me also makes sense now, she continued. He told me that Julius has been their master for a short time now, and that he's made some unpopular changes. Think back to the number of violent crimes that have been vampire-related in the past year as opposed to the previous three or four. Carl sipped his coffee, looking studious as he gave it some serious thought. Hmm, there is a point, he conceded. There have been very few vampire incidents that we've had to clean up recently. A few years ago, there would have been several a month. But now we're mostly dealing with wares and recent increase in demons and ghouls. Think he's been keeping a tight rein on them? That proves his power? I think it proves that we're not really a threat to him. She replied, 
Why would he go to such extremes to wipe out the SMV when we're no danger to him and his? Maybe he has something big planned and doesn't want us around to interfere, once he implements his nefarious scheme, he suggested. Gabby smiled tiredly at Kyle's attempt at drama and realised that they were just talking themselves in circles. She looked at the clock and the microwave and it was after 4am. No wonder they weren't making any more sense now. How about we sleep on it for now? We could tackle it in the morning with the council. Maybe some fresh minds will help make sense of this. Carl got up and took the empty mug to the sink while Gabby dished out food for Razor and Slinky. Do you want to crash here again? It will save you having to come and collect me in the morning. Carl agreed. He had fresh clothing in the van. He went out and grabbed his overnight bag and Gabby's weapons from the van and locked up the house before heading to the shower and bed. Gabby didn't bother to do more than brush her tangled hair and clean her teeth before stripping off and heading to bed as well. She decided the strapping could stay where it was. She would worry about it in the morning. She collapsed gratefully into her warm covers. Raz made a great hot water bottle and was asleep in minutes. An incessant knocking roused her. If she had a gun in her hand, she probably would have shot whoever was making the damn noise. She groggily lifted her head to peer at the bedside clock. 8.30. Lord and lady, what would make that noise go away so she could go back to sleep? Gabs, called Carl's voice loudly. You alive in there? Go away, wolf, she growled threateningly. I'm coming in with coffee, he warned. No attacking on sight and keep that monster cat of yours under control. The door clunked open as he used his elbow to manipulate the handle. He had a steaming mug in each hand. Rise and say, sleeping beauty. We have a meeting in an hour and a half. He plunked the mug down on the table next to her nose and sat on the edge of the bed, blowing on his own mug. Raz awoke under the covers and issued a warning growl. Gabby patted him quiet. Gabby pulled her face. Damn. Council meeting? Do they have to make it so early? She groused, stiffly pushing into a sitting position. She felt like she'd been run over by a truck. A large truck. The whole right side of her body was one big ache. She was going to be black and blue. The bite on her shoulder was throbbing and she could feel the pull of the stitches. The coffee made warm, comforting trails down her throat and the groggy, hungover feeling began to recede. 10am is not early in most people's books, he said in a mild rebuke. Most people don't go to bed after 4am, she muttered. Why do you look so damn chipper this morning? She hated the fact that Carl could get away with a few hours sleep and still function normally. Well, if she got less than her eight hours, she was like a zombie until at least her third cup of coffee. Carl just let her grumble away until they both finished the coffee. Do you want some help getting that strapping off before you shower? he asked. Nah, I'll manage, she replied quickly. She hadn't... She hadn't come clean about the bite yet. I'll call if I need some help. Just make sure there's some breakfast ready or I'll be forced to snack on you when I get out. Kyle chuckled as he left with the empty mugs, slinky trimmed, draped over his shoulders. Getting the sling and the strapping off was a slow, painful process. One look in the bathroom mirror was enough. She closed her eyes and climbed under the steaming flow of water, wincing as it hit the waterproof film covering her stitches. She could move her right arm a little, but it was weak and slow to respond. She guessed that meant Julius's doctor was right about the fractured collarbone. She clumsily managed to get clean, dry and dressed, not bothering to put the strapping back around her ribs. She'd go and see Ian later at the hospital if it was still bothering her. He was a lot calmer about seeing her battered and bruised than Kyle, Rose or Byron. She put the sling back on over her long-sleeved shirt, slipped her right arm into it. She felt almost ready to face the world now. Carl was busy making pancakes when she came through. Rose wasn't coming in today, with it being a Saturday, but she'd left pancake batter in the fridge. Gabby couldn't remember how she'd coped before Rose came along. They quickly glutted themselves with, on pancakes downed with maple syrup, washing them down with a second mug of coffee. Gabby popped some painkillers and they, and they were headed off to the meeting with the council. The council didn't have one set place that they convened at. They moved between several locations at random depending on who was calling the meeting. Today they were gathering at Byron's house. No one in the neighbourhood would think it's unusual that he had a few friends over for an early lunch on a Saturday. After all, he often had book club meetings with the same group of people who were arriving today. His housekeeper, Merrill was Rose's sister-in-law and completely trustworthy. Gabby knew she would have a light lunch prepared for them all, as well as snacks for the morning tea. Merrill was nearly as good at feeding people as Rose.
Carl found a spot to squeeze the van into in the large paved parking area, and Byron's four dogs came charging out to greet them. As usual, they lavished licks all over Gabby and whined in frenzied delight when she patted and rubbed each one in turn. Three of them were enormous rottweiler crosses, and the last was a small pavement special, which would have, which could have been a mixture of four or five different terriers of and t- toy poodles. Carl only got wary glances and general avoidance. All dogs saw Carl for what he truly was. Wolf. No ordinary dog with its head screwed on right challenged a wolf the size of Carl. But they also didn't seem to feel the need to grovel before him either. Perhaps because they felt he was cheating by using his form, human form. So Carl ignored them and made his way to the front door, without going in without knocking. Byron would know they had arrived. He had surveillance cameras linked, to, linked up to the parking area. Installed at the council on Gabby's insistence. Gabby disentangled herself from the mob of canines and followed him into the spacious house. Byron met them in the hall, giving Carl a warm handshake and stopping himself midway into the act of hugging Gabby as he noticed the sling, settling instead for kissing her forehead. Gabrielle, honey, you're supposed to be resting and recovering. Now you come in with your arm in a sling? He was in instant worry mode. Carl didn't tell me you'd been hurt. He looked questioningly at Carl. Don't blame Carl, Gabby sighed, wondering if Byron would ever stop fussing over her. When he contacted you, he didn't know I was injured. I didn't tell him I'd been hurt because I didn't want anybody trying anything stupid in an already volatile situation. That's all. Besides, it's not that serious. I've had worse. You'll you'll go straight to Ian once the meeting's over. He'll be on duty from midday today. Byron's tone booked no argument. Fine, okay. If that'll make you feel better, Gabby said, trying to sound more put out than she really was. She knew Ian wouldn't blab about how bad the injuries were. They had an understanding. She would follow his medical advice when she came to see him, and he wouldn't baby her or rat her out to Kyle or Byron. They both pushed the boundaries of the arrangement at at times, especially Gabby when it came to getting back to work. But it worked pretty well. And your sight too. Ian can check on that while you're there, Byron insisted. Gabby pulled a face but agreed to that too. Now, everyone is here and we're all on tender hooks wanting the details of the whole incredible story. Byron continued, You being kidnapped to have a meeting with the Master Vampires got everyone positively buzzing with speculation. Yeah, incredible is a good way to put it. Let's go through and I'll I'll explain as best I can, Gabby said. Byron led the way through to his games room at the rear of the house where the billiard table had been converted into a conference table with an easy slide-over panel. Comfortable chairs were arranged evenly around it, pens and pads of paper sat in neat piles, and a glass of chilled water stood at a coaster in each chair. The council members were scattered around the tea table in the far corner of the large room. Merrill had outdone herself in the snacks department. Scones, muffins, a cheesecake and pecan pie all called invitingly to Gabby from the little table. All the council members were present and accounted for. Athena was dressed as usual in a neat business-like suit, this one in a pale grey with lilac blouse and shoes. She already had her cup of tea and a single muffin on a plate and was heading to the table. She nodded an icy, polite greeting to Gabby and Carl and sat down, opening a slim leather briefcase to pull out a PC tablet and ignoring everyone around her. The others were far more enthusiastic in their greetings and concerned over Gabby's injuries. Margaret was a shapeshifter elder. Having reached the vulnerable age of 83, she rarely shifted anymore. But she was as sprightly as any 50-year-old Gabby knew. She was warm and grandmotherly, and she showed genuine concern for the hunters and the crew in their dangerous work. But she had a backbone of steel, and an uncanny ability to unravel any mystery, and a, me- and a memory for detail that rivaled a computer. She fussed over Gabby and asked how her eyesight was and then checked up on Razor and Slinky like she was asking after someone's children. Irene was standing next to Margaret. She was t- she was a quieter type who wasn't given to social chit-chat. When she spoke, it was generally to say something quite profound. The tall, slender, middle-aged brunette was also a magus, a powerful one. She was a senior magus to the city, and one of the people who had voted Athena into the High Council. Gabby knew that this woman saw more than you really wanted her to. Irene had the ability to see auras and she also seemed to have some innate sense that told her when someone was lying or glossing over the truth. 
She quirked one eyebrow when Gabby told Margaret that she had a simple shoulder strain. Gabby prayed she would leave well enough alone and silently thanked Carl when he pushed a cup of coffee into her hands. She was grateful that she'd shove a container of painkillers into her pocket. She'd need them before the, fa- before the meeting concluded. Rounding out the members of the council was Alistair, a, a werewolf. He was in his 40s now and had been infected by an ex-girlfriend in his late 20s. He was an unassuming but oddly attractive man with a lean, wiry build and a shock of dark blonde hair. His position as head of the Department of Prisons proved vital for the SMV cause. He could get imprisoned wares into isolation cells over full moons and was able to exert some kind of control over them while in prison, even going as far as getting them released if they were proving too much of a problem inside. Of course, those who were released early by Alistair were never seen or heard of again. It had only taken two or three of those to convince the rest to behave. The stories travelled and grew more sinister with every telling, which served Alistair's cause perfectly. He would normally have given Gabby a rough hug or a punch on the shoulder by the way of greeting, but today settled for roughing up her hair as he made his way to the table with a mound of food on his plate. Gabby mocked growled at him before following his example, heaping her own plate full of cake and pie. <clears throat> she hastily carried the plate back to the table where she'd left her coffee as Byron called everyone to their seats. She ate quickly as Byron called them to order, gave a short welcome and thanks, and then gave her the floor. Morning, everyone. Gabby said, raising out of her seat and quickly brushing crumbs off her mouth, as the small group gave her their full attention. Thanks for agreeing to this meeting on such a lot notice. Sometimes it paid to be polite. She knew how these council things worked. The less she antagonised them, the better. If you don't mind, I'm going to take a seat while I try and explain this, as it is somewhat a lengthy story. When the others murmured their assent, she sank gracefully into the chair, pulling it close to the table and leaning forward to rest her good arm on the mahogany surface. Gabby told the story, breezing over the initial ambush, but stating that she had killed two of them who attacked her. She then related the story that Julius had told her, trying to keep as close to his exact words as possible. Finally, she related what she had felt about Julius's powerful abilities and the sense of loyalty some of the other vampires had shown him, as well as her and Carl's observation that vampire-related crimes had diminished since his rule as master in the city. The others had interrupted occasionally with questions, but for the most part they made notes on their pads of paper. Gabby guessed that 120 questions would be their next game. Gabby had added in a few observations of his own and backed up several of Gabby's assessments of the situation. Finally, Gabby sat back. So the decision needs to be made as to whether you are willing to accede to his request to a meeting with him. And if you are, how and where can we accomplish that without either side feeling too insecure? She reached for a glass of water to relieve her parched throat and prepared for the onslaught. Everyone began talking at the same time, voices ranging from excitedly agitated to grumpily suspicious. Zena was sitting primly upright in her chair, studying Gabby from across the table. All right, everyone, Byron called loudly, letting them quiet down. Obviously, we have many questions for Gabby. Let's do this in a calm, ordered way. I think we'll do a lap round the table. Each of you can ask Gabby two or three questions. Once she's done with those, we'll take a lunch break and then we can let Gabby get some rest while we discuss the situation further. Gabby could have kissed him at this stage. She just wanted to have her say and get the hell out of here. She'd been dreading that Byron might keep her and Kyle in the session until the decision was reached. While the others were reading through their notes and preparing their questions, she shifted to get Kyle's attention and then peered forlornly at her empty coffee cup. Carl shook his head warily and rolled his eyes but got up and poured her a fresh cup, taking it to her at the table and muttering, You owe me big time, into her ear as he bent over her. She smiled mischievously. I'll tell Raz not to bite you for a whole month. She offered in a low teasing tone. Carl snorted and returned to his seat with a martyred look on his face. Everyone ready? Byron asked. He received nods from the other council members. Good. Athena, how about you get the ball rolling? Athena nodded, leaning forward to pick up her neatly written notes. As she looked up, Gabby realised that she wasn't going to like what Athena was about to ask, and the witch had a nasty glint in her eyes. She stilled herself. You sound like you're quite impressed by this so-called master vampire, Athena said in a clear, clipped voice. Gabby waited for her to go on, but she didn't. Was that meant to be a question? Gabby asked in a flat tone. Or are you just airing your personal views. 
Gabby bit back a smile when she noticed a slight flush rise at Athena's che- cheeks. I'm just noting, Athena ground through stiff jaws, that you don't seem quite upset with this vampire for ambushing, assaulting and kidnapping you. My actual question is whether you are an impartial witness to this thing, or if he has managed to infiltrate your mind and influence your emotions and reactions. Athena! Irene's calm, strong voice admonished sharply. A question like that is uncalled for. Athena switched her glare to Irene, eyes flashing warningly. It's it's a perfectly legitimate question. What if she's been sent by a vampire to trick us into trusting him? He can apparently control other vampires. Gabrielle has vampire blood, so there is a strong possibility that that's the reason he chose her to be his messenger. He knew he'd be able to control her. She spat the last sentence out. Gabby almost laughed out loud. If Athena actually knew exactly how Gabby had reacted to the impossibly good-looking vampire, she'd have had a far bigger leg to stand on. As it was, Gabby slowly rose to her feet, put a good hand on the table and leaned forward and leaned across towards Athena, her eyes glittering dangerously. She could hear the hissed intake of breath from the others at the table and felt Kyle tense, tense to react. As Byron started to rise to calm, rise to calm the situation, she froze him with a look. If that is what you suspect, Gabby drawled softly, then how about we prove you wrong quickly, and after that you sit down and shut up. Your question time will be over. She had to give it to the witch. She didn't back down, even though her heart was racing and her breathing was coming in short, sharp bursts. Irene, will you check my mind for any ex- extraneous presence, please? Gabby ordered quietly without taking her eyes off Athena. I don't need to check your mind, Gabby, dear. Irene stated em- empathetically. Shaking her head, I can see quite clearly that there is no disturbance in your aura. Besides your injuries, which are worse than you let on, your mind has not been tampered with. (laughs) She turned her attention to the younger Magus, which Athena would have known if she'd bothered to look for herself. She paused for a second, letting her reprimand sink in, and then directed her next comment to Athena in in person. Athena, you can't let your prejudices rule your common sense in a council session. That kind of conduct is not becoming of a member of the High Council. Athena looked shattered for a second, her face as pale as a vampire's, and then a haunty mask settled over her features as she threw herself back into the chair and folded her arms, anger flicking the taut muscle of her jaws. Wow, thought Gabby, looking uh, looking with new respect to Irene. She knew the old woman had a backbone of steel, but she never thought she'd see her bring the witch down to size like that. She took a careful, relieved breath and settled back into her own seat as Byron stood up to restore order. Please, everyone, let's not forget that Gabrielle has been through a lot in the last few days. We're not here to shoot the messenger, so keep it relevant. Try not to repeat each other's question. Margaret, what have you got for Gabrielle? Byron waved to the shapeshifter who was sitting nearest to Gabby and took his seat. Margaret shot a displeased frown at Athena's way before smiling gently at Gabby. Gabby, my dear, we all know you have as much reason to dislike and fear vampires as anyone. So I'd like to know if you feel that there isn't any merit to us meeting with this Julius. You are the one in his company and I know you to be a very good judge of character. What reservations would you have and do you think he would have any reason to try and destroy the Malus Venturi or its members? Gabby considered the question carefully before answering. As I've said before, he is a particularly powerful vampire. Kyle and I discussed this a little last night and I see no reason for him to want to destroy the SMV. We are simply no threat to him. I think his request for a meeting to set up some kind of unified group is a genuine one. Whether his need for our help is purely selfish, though, I can't tell you. Perhaps Dante is of no threat to us directly, but for what it's worth, my own gut instinct says that he's meant me and the rest of the SMV no harm. Margaret nodded thoughtfully. Thank you, my dear. You did very well in difficult circumstances. We appreciate and value any input you give us. She finished off giving Gabrielle a warm, reassuring smile. Gabby resisted the urge to glance at Athena's way to see how the witch was taking the indirect dressing down from the other council members. Alistair was next with questions about Julius's power and Dante's abilities, which Gabby couldn't really add much to besides what she'd already shared. Then he and Byron called up information on a laptop to check Carl's premise regarding the decrease in rogue vampire activity over the past 18 months and declared that it was indeed true. Byron asked about the information that Julius had about the SMV and agreed with Gabby that there must be an information leak somewhere. 
Gabby told him she felt it was a person rather than a computer leak, but nothing major seemed to have come from it, and Julius was apparently oblivious to Byron's involvement. Irene went over the conversations Gabby had with the other vampires and tried to build a clearer picture of Julius from their point of view. Of course, it could have all been an act, but it seemed unlikely they could have pulled it together on the one night that they happened to catch Gabby without a crew. It was after midnight when they broke off for lunch. Gabby immediately went to the bathroom and swallowed some painkillers before heading back to enjoy Meryl's splendid lunch spread. She and Athena stayed out of each other's way and after lunch at Byron's insistence, Carl drove her to the hospital for Ian to assess her injuries. See you next week. Bye. (laughs) 